And I'm glad to invite to my virtual studio our next speaker, Google Dev Expert, Karen Alexander Monoid. Karen, welcome to Java on Conference. Hi. So, like, really glad to have like one last conference before the end of the year. So. Yeah. Also, uh, right. Yeah. It sounds like my cat is not happy having me. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's happened. Also, let me invite here the moderator of your session, Sergey Igoretsky. Sergey, hi. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Cool, cool. Nice to have you both guys here. So, I uh, before each talk, I ask speakers about maybe some. I don't know, some spoilers, what this talk would be about. A lot of speakers decline. They say like, no spoilers. You will see the talk and understand everything. So Karen, same question to you. Will you give us some spoilers about your talk? Um, well, I guess the main spoiler you, you already uh, yeah, had in the pre presentation of Sorry. my talk. So <laughs> like, no, no PhDs needed to understand functional programming. Um, however, um, However, yeah, I would say uh, it's interesting to see how every JVM-based language handles all the popular fun uh, concepts of functional programming, and not every language is done the same. So, for example, whenever we are hearing the scary word monad, <laughs> does it imply the same uh, in Java, for example, or in Clojure? Well, the answer is, well, not really. So, yeah, functional programming has a different flavor in every language, but it's still not scary and still doesn't require a PhD. Yeah, that's that's really great that you mentioned that now a lot of Java-based languages are trying to bring more functional things inside. Well, a lot of people say that Java is just trying to mimic the other languages like Scala or Kotlin or Groovy, where the functional was from the beginning, and just bring more functional to it. What do you think of that? Um, well, I will say the Java nowadays is still not as elegant as Scala, for example, and it doesn't benefit from all the functional elements. Um, let me know if I should uh, ask my cat to leave my room. Um, if it's possible. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> maybe maybe we should uh, invite cats to... Yeah, or we may... The, the by, stream, by the way... It will be more yeah, fun. Yeah, I, I want to say <laughs> that we uh, have a lot of pictures. So it's so nice, so cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah so... I, I wanted to say that we have a lot of pictures on Instagram as we have this activity of uh, posting how I watch Java on. So a lot of people posting the photos with their uh, pets. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> people are watching the conference with the cats, with corgis and so on and so forth. That's so cool. <laughs> So yeah, my take is, well, I guess Java, <clears throat> so yeah, my take is Java may not look the best option for functional programming because the syntax is still overloaded uh, a bit. I will show you this later in my slides. However, I would say I definitely like the um, direction that Java moves forward and uh, I guess with functional programming, there's always a problem like a lot of niche languages are benefiting from functional programming, but it's really hard to adopt them because there are not a lot of candidates in the pipeline and everything. So I will talk about this also in the end. So yeah, let's see what awaits us in a couple of following years in Java. Okay, cool. Maybe, well, uh small question also from from from, from my side so uh, as as a engineer what would you suggest to look at to to start uh well learning uh, functional uh programming in, in java specifically so i know that there's a lot of resources on on scala and so on but for, for java what's, what's the entry point um well that's a good question so i would personally start with looking into what stream API brings us to. So like it has a lot of typical functions for uh, functional programming, like map, flat map and everything. I will cover this also later, but yeah, this is something that I will start with as some like Java enterprise developer. Okay, cool. So it's it seems that we have already like eight years of Java 8. <laughs> so I think most of the engineers are already familiar with streams. So the uh, I suppose that the learning curve would not be so hard for them. 
That's that's amazing, but still, you know, I uh, meet the, meet engineers who they say like, yeah, stream API that was kind of new. Maybe I have I should have a look at it. Come on, it's like a lot of years <laughs> past. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's always like surprising for me, like that uh, Java is, as I mentioned, like more than eight years passed since the release, and and and, and yet we're still like discussing like, hey, I, I'm familiar with with Stream API that is so many enhancements already came to to the language itself. So yeah. So guys, just if you, for example, thinking still like, should I have a look on Stream API or not? Yes, you should. Like uh, basically, turn off the conference. You will see it in recordings and have a look at Stream API because uh, yeah, this is something you definitely should have a look. If you already have, well, cool, you you with us. Then have a look on something from Java 17. Uh, I don't know records or and have a look on the other languages. So yesterday we had a talk about Scala from uh, Alexander Savin. He shared some in insights about that and made some announcement about this talk from Karen and. Uh, and yeah, so this is uh, what uh, we will talk about today. Okay, I think we may move to the talk itself. So just a reminder before we start. So we're collecting your questions and we have Sergey here who will help us in uh, collecting the questions and ask them. So we have three chats basically. We have a chat here in YouTube. The simplest way, just type your question and we will have it here. Second option is our Discord server where we have discussions and where we have special chat dedicated for this talk. So you may post your question there and we will have it there and also we have a chat on we are community platform you may use it as well we monitor it and uh, we take questions from all three places and last ask from me uh take the link to youtube directly bring this link to your colleagues in all your work chats and say hey guys the great talk about functional programming is happening right now you will miss a chance to participate if you want to join it right now and please do that we would be really glad if all uh, your colleagues will come to us here and uh, enjoy this talk with us okay i suppose that's basically it uh karin karen sergey good luck in this talk floor is yours let's go okay um thank you very much for the introduction and Let's get started. So my name is Karin, and today I'm going to talk about Treasure Map, functional programming and JVM-based languages. So why this talk exists? So I had a great opportunity of teaching the people from a very enterprisey Java background, and we started a brand new project in functional Kotlin, and there were interesting points that were really difficult to understand and really scary for them. However, I think we did a great job in learning how to work with functional programming and how to approach the functional style. This is one point, and another point I will introduce to you a bit later, but first, a little bit about myself. So I am a senior software engineer, and I have a background in various programming languages like Kotlin, Scala, both on front end and back end, but also Clojure, a little bit of Java, and Golang, which is absolutely not functional. I am based in Germany, in Potsdam, and I'm living here with two really nice cats. One of them you've seen in the introduction of my talk. And last but not least, I'm a Google developer expert in Kotlin. Um, a fun fact about myself, at least twice I got a feedback that people came to my talk about functional programming, not because they are interested in functional programming or interested in Kotlin, but they really liked my cats and really wanted to see them live once again. So as I mentioned, I had an opportunity to teach people with various backgrounds functional programming. Another interesting point in general is that people are scared by how functional programming is represented. Even on the conferences, there is a big problem that people are really fine with talks about internals of the JVM, bytecode, everything. But whenever they hear the word monad, 
everyone is losing their minds uh, and like, no, no, like monads are way too scary. I'm not going to this talk, sorry. And I think it's also a big problem in the community where a lot of talks about functional programming are started with the slide about um, theory of the category. So people don't really understand what's going on. And in the most cases, in my opinion, that's not needed, which is why I want to show you an uh, overview, somewhat entry-level talk, which will be not academical and not strict, but I hope that it will give you a clearer view why elements of functional programming are something that you could incorporate in your code base on the daily basis. So our today's agenda will be elements of functional programming, monads, error handling, and when to use. So why monads and error handling? Those are two interesting applications of functional programming that everyone can use. And elements of functional programming, that is something that we will start with. I will show you examples in five languages in Kotlin, Java, Scala, Clojure, and Groovy. All of them are JVM-based languages. However, every language has an, its own flavor and its own approach to functional programming and what you can do with it. So let's get started. Elements of functional programming. As the software engineers, we are dealing with the problem on, of complexity on the daily basis. And we are trying to solve it in a different ways. So for example, using different paradigms of programming, for example, object-oriented, when our logic is scoped to something smaller, like objects. However, there is another approach called functional programming. So what parts are essential for functional programming? Well, as you can tell from the name, functions is the most important part of it. Those functions are pure, have no side effects, are lazy, so they are calculated only when we need them, not when we define them. The application is stateless and we are dealing with immutable data. Let's get started with pure functions. So what exactly is a pure function? A pure function is such a function where same input yields the same output. So for example, when we have a function called increment, for example, and we define it on integers, we know that every time we pass one to this function, we will get two. When we pass two, we will get three, and so on. And every time we will pass one, we will get two. And the same rule holds for the every possible input that we define this function on. The second property of a pure function is there should be no side effects. A side effect could be imagined as something that is outside of our control. So for example, the database. We can try to write something into the database. However, this database may no, not exist, like the AWS may be down or something outside of our control happened. So we cannot be sure that every write to the database will yield the same result. So most of the are something IO related. And technically, I would say writing logs may be considered like not so pure enough. However, the main point here is, as I told you, this chapter is called elements of functional programming, which is why we are talking about pure functions as a perfect concept and something that we are striving for when it fits, but not every time. And we are not trying to confess our auditors or business owners that, no, we won't store anything into the database and we will not write, write any logs because it's, it's not fun, it's not functional, it's not pure. So no, we are not doing this. It's the same thing as an object-oriented programming. 
We don't write every hello world in a object oriented way. Sometimes we are referring to um, procedural programming. And the same is true for functional programming. We are trying to do our best. However, we are mindful when it's best to use that and when to refrain from it. And the last property is every function should not alter any global state. So since, as you can see, we don't like change any data, the second important concept for functional programming will be immutability. Every language has own built-in things related to immutability. So for example, Java now has records, and before that we had finals. Uh, in Kotlin, we have files in Scala also, and various collections. In Clojure, everything by default is immutable. And in Groovy, we have various annotations for that. Also, Java and Kotlin have their popular functional programming frameworks. For Java, it's Vower, and for Kotlin, it's Arrow. But first, let's take a look at uh, the types of the immutability. I roughly call them true immutability and reference immutability because not every immutability is the same one. So taking this example, when we have final list assigned to uh, arrays S list, we cannot reassign it to anything else because it's final. However, we can alter the content of the list itself using, for example, set. There are so workarounds with wrapping it, for example, into unmodifiable list or use list of instead of erase as list. However, the interesting point here is since it's just called list, we cannot simply tell which type of immutability awaits us because we can still call set or, um, or for example, clear, remove, etc. However, it may result into a runtime exception. Also, the deep structures and nested structures are typically not covered. Okay, that's for Java, but is there something interesting in other languages? Groovy is roughly the same as Java, but it has a nicer way to cast the collection to immutable counterpart. Scala has three types of immutability. Scala collection, where you cannot modify, but someone else might be able to. Immutable, when nobody can modify it, and regular mutable collections. However, in immutable, the nested structures, if I recall correctly, also are also not covered. In Kotlin, the situation is roughly the same. However, immutable collections needs to be imported from the outside, namely Kotlinx collections immutable. In Clojure, everything is truly immutable. Well, technically, you can import mutable collections directly from JDK, but we generally assume that if you're doing that, you are ready to face the consequences of that. So good luck. And yeah, that's it for the collections overview. And the question is, so since all the collections are in some way immutable, how do we deal with the data that we have? Like we cannot say like write once and don't touch anything. And for that, we have multiple functions that are considered standard for functional programming because while we cannot change the existing structures, we can create a new one based on the previous ones. Let's start with 
map. Map function is quite straightforward. So for every element, we are taking it and transforming it. And the important property here is the size is preserved. So for four frogs, we will have four unicorns and so on. For Java, most of such functions are in the stream API. So you will implicitly cast it to stream. And in Groovy, you can notice that the naming is a little bit different. If uh, I think it's uh, related to the fact that the functional programming um, was introduced to Groovy a little bit earlier than the that it was more or less standardized across the industry. And some naming in Groovy is better or worse, but let's see. Here it's called collect. It works exactly the same. It just has another name. And in closure, everything is also the same, just in the different order. Cool. Now we have half map. What else? Filter. Let's filter unicorns out of the frogs. I personally don't like the name filter because it's always confusing. What does this name imply? Because it can be keep if predicate matches or remove if predicate matches. In all those languages, it's keep. And Groovy does here a great job calling it find all because you don't have to remember which kind of filter is that. Although I, I will say filter is mostly keep filter. And yeah, you're just passing the predicate by which you will filter the existing collection. The next one is a little bit more complicated and it's called fold. Fold is when you have multiple elements in your collection and you want to collect them back into a single element. So for example, if you have a list of integers, you may want to sum them or multiply them. A fold typically is represented by a function that will be applied to the elements and the starting element called accumulator. So for multiplication of integers, I will start with one. For concatenation of characters, I will start with an empty string and so on. In Groovy, it's called inject. In Java, it looks a little bit different from anything else because it's implemented via collect and collector. Collector is actually a structure of four parts. The supplier, the initial element, reducer, the instruction of how to add one more element to the initial one, merger for parallel stream, how to concatenate two intermediate results, and finisher, what to do in the end. For example, one may do string builder to string. A typical collector that you may know is to string or to list. The next one is flatten. Flatten is when we have a nested collection, for example, a list of lists, and we want to like push the elements out of the nested function uh, of the nested container and bring them to the same level. It's, I think, more a visual thing, uh, which is better, which is easier to understand with this emoji part. And the interesting thing is Java has no flatten. However, Java has a flat map function. A flat map function can be imagined as a combination of map and flatten operations. So when our map result 
will be ending with a nested structure. Our flat map function as a finishing move would lift the elements in from there. Let's call them internal containers. And out of all of these functions, I would say flat map is the most important one. Why? Because it's related to monads. So let me introduce you to monads. Like everyone knows that a monad is just a monoid in the category of the end of functors. So yeah, that's true, but that's not helpful for the most of us. Can we think of a simpler approach for, to understanding the monads? Well, I figured out that it's better to go by example. So do you know monads? Maybe, maybe not. But have you used a list? That's a monad. So why exactly list is a monad? Because in simpler terms, a monad is a type and instance of which can be created. So for example, list of, and which has a flat map function. There are also monadic laws to guarantee consistency, but we won't cover them here for the sake of simplicity. And Scala really benefits from monads and flat map chaining using pattern of monad comprehensions. If you have a long chain of the calculations, for example, on the list, you can replace it with for yield. If the monad context so is the same, so if everything here is still a list, it will be automatically unwrapped, the necessary operation will be applied. And the good news here is list is not only List is not a list is not the only monad. There are more, especially in Scala. For example, option. Option is such a type where there may be value, for example, some five, and they may be no value, so none. And the flat, flat map can be imagined roughly as the flat map for the list. So sum of sum five will be lifted to sum five. And the same syntax will be used for monad comprehensions over options. Other languages don't have monad comprehensions out of the box. However, in Java and Kotlin, you're, you can introduce them via external libraries. So for example, for Kotlin, it will be arrow. So can we have another example of a useful pattern for functional programming on the day-to-day -day basis? And the answer is sure. Let's go to the arrow handling. Let's start with Java first. So if something is wrong, we can, or some, we know that something may go wrong in our function, we will write something like this typically. If something's wrong, throw a new exception, and that's totally fine. Then we will handle it somewhere by writing throws in the method signature, and later, when calling this function, we will write something like this, try, catch, maybe finally. And this works, and it's absolutely fine. But maybe I, will, I would like to use some newer Java, and I want to use the stream API. So I will write something like this and stream range for each and color, color function. However, the bad news is I cannot do that. 
because test function has a checked exception and I will be forced to handle it somehow. For example, I call write try catch right here in the place, but it doesn't really look nice. And the benefit of the stream API is questionable in that case. So the typical pattern for handling such the situations will be wrap a function into another function. I called it hide exception, which won't throw a checked exception and then unwrap it into something else later. So that's unfortunate. How do other languages deal with this problem? The good or the bad news is in Kotlin, Groovy, Scala, and Clojure, checked exceptions are gone. Well, is it for good or for the bad? That's debatable. However, the same function will be rewritten into a really, really short way in all of those languages. That's great. However, one may want to know that something or like show that something may go wrong at some point. How do languages deal with that? Groovy doesn't, so like you don't have any checked exceptions, so like accept and move on. In Kotlin, however, we have multiple options. For example, null. For the simple cases, when, for example, we are parsing an integer from the string, we can just say to int or null. We will get null if it's not parsable into integer or, or integer if everything goes fine. And for the simple cases, it's absolutely fine to do that. However, even here, one may want to differentiate between for example, integer was like way too long and it's a proper number, but too big. Or for example, this was an absolute not number, not a number string, some alpha uh, alphanumeric randomly passed to this function. So those are two different cases. And sometimes I would like to know the difference. Well, what else does Kotlin have? Kotlin has a so-called result type and multiple functions to do that. So for example, run catching will give us out the result type, which we will handle later with, for example, on success, on failure functions. However, there is no, no more information that, than from nulls in my opinion and run, run catching is actually really greedy it catches everything throwable and in my experience i already seen when run catching cough out of memory exception out of memory error and it was not so fun to figure out so well Sometimes there are situations when we can list all the possible failures or errors and we can explicitly define them using seal types in Kotlin. For example, imagine we have a function to invest and every like, investor knows that there are only three possible outcomes out of every invest investment. It's successfully invested you lost money because you did a bad choice or the economical crisis happened and everyone lo lost, lost, their, lost their money. And what's interesting here, it's often used in the pattern when there is only one happy path and multiple failures. And we can actually benefit from that, as you will see later. But let's take a look at Scala first. 
Scala has a, a, a similar to nulls function, but it's to int or option, which we've already seen. It's a monad with a flat map function. And another interesting structure in Scala is either. Either can be left and right. The mnemonic here is right is right. So on the right side, we will store the result of a successful call. And on the left side will be something explaining what exactly went wrong. So for example, here, um, find user resulted in some user not found. For example, um, as you can remember, we described in Kotlin with sealed type, you can do something the same, something roughly the same in Scala and pass user not found to the left side of either. What's important here as an uh, option, either is also a monad. So you can chain your calculations if they're um, keeping their context. So for example, you can do find user ID and based on that ID, you can call balance later instead of chaining and unwrapping them from the either container. For such chainings, the important rule here is if either on any point turns left, the chain is stopped and this left result is returned as the main result of this chaining calculations. So for example, if find user will return something like left user not found, we are not going to calculate the balance for this one. While Scala is the only language out of those, it's interesting that we can add either to Kotlin and Java using external libraries. So for Kotlin, it will be arrow. So how do we handle problems in closure them? Like you're using REPL to test all your hypothesis. It's interesting to know that closure is known for being functional language. However, it's not really benefiting from monads and you won't really find a lot of monads in closure libraries because you cannot really benefit from them here. So what can you try? with all those languages. As I told you, uh, Clojure is the best used with just REPL. For Scala, you can try CATS or Zio, or maybe there is something new here already. For Kotlin, try Arrow. And I guess for Java and Groovy, the best choice is still Vower. However, I don't think it's gaining more popularity in the last year or, or so. Um, the conclusions of this talk are, you are already using the elements of functional programming into uh, in your daily life. So you're using the stream API, Th those are also functional elements. So as you are not using pure object-oriented programming, you also shouldn't try if you don't need to, to use purely functional programming. Another important point here is consider the support of libraries. So introducing Arrow to Kotlin is quite popular, I would say. However, introducing Vower or some um, exotic library for closure, maybe something that you shouldn't 
like do right from the beginning if you don't have like knowledge about the state of the ecosystem of the of every language and while introducing your team to um, the new approach to software engineering you have to consider their knowledge because for example Closure is a quite niche language and it's really hard to, to, to hire people because uh, there are not a lot of people using Closure. And if there are, and even if there are a lot of people that want to use Closure, you will still have to introduce it to them. So it's a lot of maybe onboarding costs and, um, Functional programming is still like gaining its attention and it's not a standard in the wide sense. Um, however, it's the more, more and more projects are written in a such a way. And the last point, but not least that I hear about functional programming is that immutability may be a bit slow and I will say sometimes this argument is done in a really bad faith and the benchmark, the benchmarks are done on the, for example, sorting algorithms. And it's written in that way that I wouldn't like, wouldn't write it in the functional style. So the, so the um, comparison face to face just doesn't make sense. And for example, I had a great experience with Kotlin and Arrow in the project that dealt with financial fraud and it worked just fine and quite fast. And in my opinion, if you consider functional programming slow in general, maybe JVM based languages may be not your first choice and there you are trying to solve the wrong problem. And yeah, I think that's it for the main points and I will be happy to answer all of the questions if you have them. Yeah, we have some, uh, yeah, okay, Sergey is with us. <laughs> I'm, I'm always here. Okay, so yeah, actually we have a couple of uh, questions uh, from our audience and let me start uh, with the very first uh, question from Andre. So uh, we usually compare size of code. Is there any way to compare uh, readability of code? So I believe the question is the readability of a functional style and, and well, the, the regular approach. Um, that's a good question. So I cannot think of any like really good metric of how to compare uh, like truly so in my opinion it really depends on how do you write it you can write really bad functional code however you can write really really bad um, object oriented um, code when an object is an object and it inherits another object so like yeah i don't have a proper metric however i don't think that a functional code is less readable than any other although i will make a remark about closure it's written in a completely different way and coming from java it may take some time to adjust to it because seeing two plus two as plus two two may be a bit overwhelming Okay, yeah, I, I also think that it's it's a very subjective metric when we're talking about readability, and it always comes to my mind this quote by Martin Fowler that good programmers write code that humans can understand. So it's it's very subjective. All right, let us uh, move on to another question. I can see question from uh, Tatiana. So is it a good approach to combine different paradigms? paradigms in a single project like OP and uh, functional style programming? Uh, well, I think absolutely. So for example, even if you're a Java developer, you may really benefit from um, yes, yeah, stream API and handling the collections. So I think it's a really good start by just combining them. 
yeah, and, and speaking of, of a good start, uh, we have another follow-up question by Tatiana. So as for the newcomer, for example, in Java, is this a good idea to learn, well, functional programming features at the very beginning, or it would be better to strengthen uh, your OP knowledge first? Um, well, it depends what exactly is the very beginning. So really depends on how do you learn the language. So I think starting with um, Stream API, for example, can be done quite fast. And I think actually thinking of uh, a language and architecture are two separate skills and there is like, the, the, they are more parallel, not like interchangeable. Yeah, I, I remember when I just started to get used with the stream approach in, in, in Java, to me it looks very natural. I mean, you just you just type and it's, it's, it's very natural. <laughs> All right, so no more questions from the chat, but I have my own couple of questions. So we've sure. covered typical use cases for, for uh, functional programming. So, but for, from, from your point of view, when, when sh you should definitely not use any functional programming approach. Um, well, I guess there may be some cases when you have the requirements for like really high performance and you, but it's like the level when you want to tune your JVM and like do really, um, low level stuff. Another interesting point that I always make is sometimes your team just doesn't have any knowledge for a critical project that has to be done tomorrow <laughs> yeah uh, and sometimes you just don't have a capacity or budget for hiring the experts and in that case i may expect that the functional approach when you have no experience in your team may be uh, a wrong one so introducing of uh, elements of functional programming would work just fine in the team, even without the experience. So for example, even monad comprehensions in either uh, in Kotlin was something that we were able to introduce from the day one because everyone was like, okay, now I see it and it's really readable. So like seeing a column of calculations and it looks pretty nice. Um, however, yeah as in every part of software engineering, it may be, yeah, may be written into in the non-authentic way and may be not readable or not maintainable. It's just the same, almost the same as if Java developer suddenly switches to Kotlin, it will be written, but maybe not in, in, not in the best way. Yeah, using all this functional style could be fun and exciting, but you should definitely assess your team capabilities before moving on with it. Okay, I see uh, Roman joined, so maybe any, any questions yeah, from just, your side? Just, no, I, no, not a question. I just want to join the discussion because <laughs> uh, recently I made a talk on our local community regarding reactive streams, which has the same paradigm of functionality and, and about processing the data in functional styles in streams. And this is really not the easy way to change your, like, way of thinking because previously you think in an imperative way like okay I can do this this and that and now you should start thinking that you construct a pipeline and you don't have data on the moment when you construct pipeline you just have the uh, like you uh, like you know you are on the next level of uh, abstraction so before you have data and code now you have data pipeline in the code like so uh, i i hope i uh, describe it okay so yeah this is really hard but it's really useful and when you uh, are when you're able to understand this this is so cool then you can control this so yeah just guys if you haven't tried yet uh, uh this style of programming if you haven't tried yet uh kotlin scala groovy closure or any other language which java in java ecosystem which is functional by, by its nature i know there would be people who would say that kotlin is not but still uh, uh try it 
try it and you will see the uh, the power which you will have in, in your hands with that. Okay, and we have <coughs> another question from, from the audience. So speaking of some best practices, so any, any recommendations from your side on the best practices uh, for the functional style? Anything that um, comes to that, your mind? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I think every language has its own specifics. So there is no advice like one size fits all. So I would say try to keep your data immutable as a first step because yeah, it saves you from some possible mistakes and errors. And that will be yeah, the first advice that I will give to any beginner here. Right. Thank you so much, Karin, for your answers. I think we're running out of questions from the audience. So maybe. Yeah, um... we uh, also have a comments from the audience that you're awesome. And thank you very much for the talk. It was really great. So thank you very, very much. And yeah, by the way, the memes which you have in your presentation is just like great. <laughs> so <laughs> people just love it. So thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, it was really a pleasure to have you here and uh, hope to see you on our on our other conferences. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So have a nice rest of the conference and see you. Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot. So uh, thank you, Sergey, also for moderation.